Um, hello everybody. Um, in this video, what we're going to be focusing on is a key part of theme four and the first topic, so 4.1. This topic, th this video should I say, is all about the restrictions on free trade. So what we're going to be looking at is, first of all, we're going to recap over the benefits of free international trade, which of course is a key part of globalisation. We're then going to be thinking about the drawbacks of free international trade. And then we're going to start to think about if trade is such a bad thing, what can economies do to protect themselves from international competition? And then we'll think about the benefits and drawbacks of that protectionism from taking place. Right. Um, what I'd like you to do first of all, then, please, is to write down the answer for this question. So hit pause and try and think about five benefits of international trade, please. Uh, once you've put them down, hit play and we'll have a look at the answers. Right, here we go then everyone. Um, trade, what are the benefits of it first of all? So if we allow for free international trade, then the logic would be that trade will be based on both absolute and comparative advantage. Now what we know is that if countries specialise in what they're best at making, this would lead to an increase in global output. It would mean that inefficient industries and in economies will close down and countries will instead import those goods and services, which will mean that more resources can move towards producing what that economy is better at making. So if we have that increase in global output, it means there's, there's a growth in global GDP, which would mean that there's better living standards for people because people can access more um, goods and services, satisfy more wants and needs. Because resources are also moving towards industries which economies are efficient at making, it should also mean that there's more job opportunities because people can access not just more jobs, but better jobs in those growth industries. Hopefully wage rates will grow on the back of that. Now, what trade also does, it allows for a phenomenal amount of global competition. So what that competition does, it gives people increased amounts of choice to access not just more goods and services, but also better goods and services and generally at lower prices too. Uh, the next one is transfer of technology. What trade allows countries to do is to import better consumer and capital goods that have maybe got access to better technology than what we've got available in our economy. So if households can buy better technology, well, that allows households to satisfy more wants and needs, but also if firms can import better capital goods, machinery, infrastructure, that will make them more productive at producing output in our economy. Further to this is something we call economies of scale, and this is the benefits of producing for a global market. So we're going to be looking at economies of scale in more detail in theme three. But the basic argument is that the average cost of producing a good or a service will fall as firms scale up production onto a global um, scale. So the idea would be to give you an example, if firms are producing output for, let's say, two or three billion customers across the world, they can spread the research and development costs of designing products over a much bigger number of customers, and that makes it cheaper to produce goods and services. And that could lead to firms becoming more profitable, but also hopefully firms passing on some of these cost savings onto consumers in terms of lower prices. Uh, the next one is growing global competition. And this is just a simple idea that if you've got more firms across the world competing with domestic firms and other foreign firms, it will incentivize firms to become more dynamic, uh, dynamic, invest into better machinery, better capital, become more productive, cut prices, raise the quality of their products. But also it means that firms are accessing a global supply chain for their resources. And that would mean ultimately those firms can maybe access cheaper inputs that they need to produce their goods and services. All of this would lead to growing markets for goods and services. Firms can grow, become more profitable, employ more people. And again, that should boost living standards even further. Uh, some of the disadvantages, though, um, if you're a country like the UK, who have had a trade deficit for many years now, then you've got the problems associated with that. You know, trade deficits mean that um, certain industries in our economy, such as heavy manufacturing, like um, steel production, are in decline. And that means the people that lose their jobs in those industries often suffer from structural unemployment because they lack the skills to move into new growth industries in export markets. And that can fuel more inequality and relative poverty in the UK. 
and that has gone largely towards contributing towards the north-south divide. So many people in the north of England whose jobs have gone because of free trade and global competition are now moving into zero-hour contract, underemployment type of work, and that is leading to that growth in inequality um, across the country. You've also got the problems of dumping. Um, global competition is fine as long as other countries pl play fair. Now, dumping is where um, some economies would subsidise production of certain goods and services. They then dump these products in global markets at very, very low prices, and that forces domestic firms to go bust. So, you know, you've got this problem in steel production where China has been renowned for dumping very cheap, um, below cost price steel into European markets. And that means that European firms can't compete and they go bust. And again, that can contribute towards growing structural unemployment and deindustrialization. You've also got the risks of external shocks. So this is where you have problems that originate in one economy quickly spread across the world. So if you're relying on exporting products to another economy and they fall into recession, then it means that your export markets might dry up. But it also means if there are problems in the supply chain, you know, linked to natural disasters or issues in different parts across the world, it might mean that your firms lack the ability to buy the resources they need to produce goods and services. Uh, what we know is as well that only the industries in your economy that have absolute and comparative advantage will grow. Other industries that you'd lack competition in will start to shrink and decline and that means that you've got unequal growth across your country. You've also got the spread of global monopolies. So um, a monopoly is where one firm dominates the market. Well, some of the world's biggest firms have been renowned for going up, gobbling up other big firms from across the world to create these phenomenally large global firms. And these multinational corporations have got so much power and influence now that their output is actually bigger than that of some economies. And that means they can use that to exploit, you know, national governments by demanding lower tax rates, not paying taxes. If they lack domestic competition, they might raise prices. You've also got the problem of something we call the infant industry argument. So, for example, you might have a small industry within your economy that could become competitive if it was given the chance to grow. But due to phenomenally large global competition, it can never get off the ground. OK, uh, and then finally, you've got something called monopsony power. Now, a monopsony is a sole buyer of a good or a service. And this is probably more of a problem for developing nations. So, for example, if you're if you're um, a country that relies on exporting cocoa across the world, there might be only a small number of big buyers of your cocoa. This could be, you know, um, European chocolate bar manufacturers. Now, what these European chocolate bar manufacturers are able to do is to dictate prices they pay to these poor farmers. And that come in the people that grow these products are forced to accept really, really low prices. All because of um, the power that these big firms can exert over them across the world. Right now, anyway, then um, we've seen that there are clearly benefits and drawbacks to international trade. This gives you in a bit more detail some of the reasons why you might want to limit international trade. So limit the imports coming into your economy. So you might do it to allow infant industries to grow. So the idea be would be that you might have in your economy a small fledgling industry. It could be linked to technology, let's say. And if they were able to grow, they could become a global competitor for the biggest firms in the world. But the problem is if they're up against these big global firms that are you know, more established in the markets, then these firms will never get the chance to grow and flourish. But if we could protect them from that foreign competition, allow them to grow, they could become a major export earner for our economy, but only if they're given that protection for a short amount of time. Now, the opposite of an infant industry is something called a sunset industry. Now, in the UK, this could be you know, um, steel production. So, you know, big employers, really, really important for certain regions across our economy. Um, but under pure international trade, they lack the ability to compete on a global scale. So what you might do, you might put strategies in place to protect these firms from from foreign competition. So you might put taxes on imports or limit how many imports can come in to protect these big domestic firms that employ lots and lots of people. Um, now, another one could just be just to protect jobs. 
what we know is that imports are withdrawal from the economy. They reduce aggregate demand. So if you can limit the imports coming in, you're stopping that withdrawal of cash. You're hopefully raising demand for domestic goods and services and therefore protecting domestic jobs. Now, a further argument is something we call the self-sufficiency argument. Um, if you rely on trade based on absolute and comparative advantage, what if you lack advantages in production in most things? It means that all those industries will decline in your economy. And that means that you become reliant on other economies to access essential goods and services. So many would argue that there are certain things that we shouldn't be relying on importing into our country. Many would say um, defence equipment and technology, we shouldn't be importing it. So even if we're not very good at making it compared to other countries across the world, it's something you should be self-sufficient in making. So you might stop the imports coming to allow those firms to grow. Many people would apply the same argument to steel production. You know, in times of war, you need to be able to produce steel for tanks and guns and aeroplanes. So you should really be able to produce your own steel. So what you might want is to protect big industries, but you think you should be able to produce yourself. Many people say things like food production. You shouldn't be reliant on importing most of your food into your country. Um, next reason could just be to reduce trade deficits. So, you know, prevent the imports coming in to help improve your current account on the balance of payments. It could be retaliation. So if another economy imposes restrictions on your exports going into their economy, you might just do the same back, tip for tap. You've got this at the moment between China and America, but they often retaliate against each other's trade restrictions. So if they if one country poses restrictions on us exporting to them, we'll do the same thing back to them. It could be to prevent dumping. So what we mentioned before was that Chinese steel has been dumped across the world to almost force domestic firms to go bankrupt. So we might argue that's unfair competition. So we want to simply prevent that from happening. It could be to reduce competition. <clears throat> what we know is that competition would raise um, or reduce the ability of our firms to make profits and then struggle. So we might simply want to prevent those imports coming in to protect our firms from intense foreign competition. That wouldn't protect us jobs and wages, but it would raise it would protect the profits of those big firms as well. And those firms might be important tax contributors towards the UK's fiscal policy. And then finally, um, protect industries of strategic importance. In many ways, this is a little bit like the self-sufficiency argument. Now, the idea is in times of trouble, war, you know, natural disasters, that type of thing, the argument goes there are certain things you should not be relying on importing into your economy. So we're looking at essential items. It could be food, it could be steel, um, it could be, you know, uh, the ability to generate electricity. We shouldn't be relying on foreign economies to provide us with those goods and services. Right. Um, what I'd like to now do then, please, is to, is to pause and think about this question. So identify and explain three reasons why an economy may decide to limit their involvement in trade. So to you, what do you think are the three most important reasons for protecting your economy from foreign imports? So please hit pause and when you're ready, please hit play again. Right, now before we start thinking about how we protect, let's think about the impacts of protectionism. Now on consumers, what we would generally say is that limiting imports is bad for consumers because those imports are generally um, imported because they're cheaper than domestic goods or a better quality than British goods and services. So preventing those imports coming in is forcing people to buy more expensive, lower quality, lower choice domestic goods and services. Now, the further to that as well, though, um, if we take away the imports, we're reducing the competition that our firms face. And that could mean our firms feel less need to become efficient, to innovate, which again could lead to higher prices and lower quality for our consumers. Now, further to this as well, if you reduce competition, it means that firms will feel like they can raise prices. They're not competing with those foreign firms anymore. And that, of course, will mean that we're less able to buy and we generate less consumer surplus in markets as well. Um, but there is a bit of a potential benefit. 
if we're protecting domestic industries who um, could become competitive and efficient with that protectionism, then those firms have now got a bit of room to grow. They can develop advantages in production and that could give us as consumers um, good access to domestically produced goods and services. Of course, as well, if these things are, if protection is protecting jobs, then it's protecting wages, which allows us to be consumers as well. But generally, I think we'd argue that protectionism is bad for consumers. Now, for producers, you can view it in a few different ways. If you're a firm that is now facing less foreign competition, then it means that you can expand your production because you've got more domestic consumers and you can probably raise prices, which means you can make more profits. Um, some problems, though. You could be a firm that has to import. <clears throat> this could be natural resources like commodities. It could be semi-finished goods, so this could be a car manufacturer importing engine components. What protectionism will do will make it more difficult for you to access cheap, readily available supply in global supply chains. It might mean you're forced to buy from domestic firms again, and that could mean less choice, higher prices, lower quality. Um, it could also mean that firms in Britain that want to export might struggle. Because if we impose protectionism on foreign firms, it's likely their governments will do the same to our firms, which means that our firms that rely on export, it might suddenly find their export markets start to dry up. So for producers, everyone, it's a little bit more debatable whether it's good or bad. There are some clear benefits in terms of less competition, help you grow, become more profitable. But drawbacks could be more expensive imports of raw materials, but also it could be um, drying up export markets if other economies retaliate against you. Now, for governments, you could argue there are some key short run benefits. When we start to think about how we protect our economy, it's often through what we call tariffs, which are taxes on foreign goods and services. Well, we're still going to import, but it now means that the government are generating tax revenue from these imports. Well, that could improve government finances. And further, if we're protecting jobs and domestic firms, then it means there's more corporation tax coming in, there's more VAT coming in, there's more income tax being generated, less need to pay unemployment benefits. So what this will hopefully do is to boost the popularity of governments in the short run. But in the long run, it could be quite good, uh, quite bad, I beg your pardon, for government finances. Because what it's doing, it's stopping resources moving away from inefficient industries towards more efficient industries. Now, what that will mean is then that if we're allowing the economy to base itself on free trade, um, inefficient industries will close down and then the resource will slowly move away towards more efficient industries. And if that happens, it's likely that the economy will perform better, have better economic growth, higher employment, which means that more tax money can be generated. We've also got to remember as well that protection is covered via domestic subsidies. So we might simply donate big sums of money to domestic firms you know, maybe sunset industries. Well, that counts a huge tax burden for the government. You know, lots of government spending is going towards propping up big inefficient firms. It's also possible that you could argue these firms are suffering from moral hazard. They're relying on the government for these constant handouts to keep them in operation. They feel less need to become efficient and stand on their own two feet. We've also got to bear in mind, though, as well, that um, if our government puts in protectionist policies, then other economies are likely to retaliate against us. So our economy might suffer through, from lower exports that could reduce aggregate demand and therefore lead to more unemployment and then lead to um, the government needing to pay out more unemployment benefits and generate lower taxes. So for the government, it might be quite good in the short run, but in the long run, I would argue protection is generally quite a bad thing again. Now, in terms of living standards, um, reducing competition, it could help workers in the UK. If we reduce the competition that our uh, workers, our, our businesses face from abroad, there's less downward pressure on prices. So that will protect jobs, but it will also allow firms to start raising prices. Well, that could be a really, really good thing because a lot of the people who are in relative poverty in Britain, they often work in low skill work that is potentially the type of work that can be outsourced to poorer countries across the world. Well, if we stop the imports coming and we're creating jobs for low income people, which tackles inequality and can improve living standards. But what we do know though is, though, that it will lead to higher prices. So if you can't import, you're having to rely on domestic goods and that could lead to more inflation, therefore hurt 
living standards due to um, reduced ability to buy goods and services. Um, I'm going to say overall, personally, that I think protectionism creates more bad than good. It's genuinely bad for consumers. It can be really bad for firms. In the long run, it's quite bad for governments. And if it's raising prices in the long run and reducing efficiency, then it's bad for human development indexes as well. Right, what I would now like to do, please, is to pause by thinking about the benefits and drawbacks of protectionism. So write down the questions, uh, write down your answers whilst you pause the video. And when you're happy to move on, please, please press play. Right now, we're now thinking about what can we do to prevent the inputs coming into our economy? So in other words, what can we do to protect our firms from foreign competition? So what we're doing is we're trying to impose barriers to trade, make it more difficult for foreign economies to sell their goods and services in our economy. Now, what we might go for is a quota where we literally place a number on how many imports can come into the country. So we're not saying they can't come in, we're just placing a limit on how many can come in. So you might place a quota on how many foreign cars can be imported each year. Now, if you place a quota on the imports, it means they're in quite limited supply and it tends to raise the price of these imports in your economy, which means that people are less likely to buy them. But also limiting how many can come in is forcing more people in Britain to buy domestic goods and services. Um, now, it could also be a voluntary export restraint. So the idea is here is this is generally economies that are, um, are exporting a lot to one economy. So the idea could be that um, you've got country A, which exports a phenomenal amount of products to country B. So country B has got a huge trade deficit with country A. Now, country A might not be panicking, thinking country B is likely to impose protectionist policies on me. So rather than making them do that, I'm going to agree with them to reduce my exports to keep them happy. So we're trying to prevent the importers from imposing lots of stiff, difficult protectionist policies by trying to appease them by agreeing to export less to them in the first place. Now, the next one could be export subsidies. So this could just be simply um, saying to domestic firms, here you go, here's a big pot of government money. Well, that means that production for that can lower prices and therefore become more competitive against foreign firms. It might even help them export more across the world as well. Now, the final one I've put down here is a non-tariff barrier. Now, these are often called hidden barriers. So what we could do, we could um, say to economies across the world, OK, you can export your products into our economy, but they must comply with some very stiff health and safety regulations or environmental regulations, or they've got to be labelled in a particular way. Now, what these things do, they make it more difficult for other economies to sell their goods and services in our economy. So if we've got really, really high health and safety regulations, it could mean that other economies across the world that can't meet them standards are not able to export their products into the UK, especially if there's lots of bureaucratic paperwork involved. So in other words, they might have to complete lots of paperwork to prove they meet our expectations. Well, that's really expensive and time consuming and might make it more difficult for a country to export to you. Now, the environmental one is a really, really important one. What we know is across the world, um, environmental rules are a lot slacker than what they are in our economy. So rather than allowing firms to pollute massively overseas and sell their goods in our economy, we could argue that's an unfair advantage. So what we might say is if we're going to buy products from another country, the firms that made them in them foreign countries must meet the standards that our businesses are expected to meet. And again, that will make it more difficult for these countries to sell their goods in our economy. Right now, the tariff one is probably the most difficult one to explain because this one involves a diagram. Right now, just think about the blue lines, first of all. Look at the demand line, demand DOM. That stands for demand domestic or domestic demand. This is domestic demand for goods and services. So what you'd expect, and you can see if price levels fall, the demand from UK citizens for goods and services will increase. Supply domestic. This is the supply of goods and services by our businesses in our economy. So the idea is when if we were a closed economy, we didn't allow any international trade to take place, we would operate where supply DOM meets demand DOM. So all goods and all services would be 
in effect demanded or supplied by UK firms and bought by UK consumers. Right now, if we were to allow free trade to take place, the price would go down from that blue equilibrium point down to PW. PW stands for price world. OK, so at price world, we've now allowed more or less an infinite amount of imports into our economy. Now, with that price world, domestic supply is now only at sea. So we're now at that new low price, less willing and able to produce goods and services at sea. Domestic demand, though, is all the way at G at price world. So look at that at C, we've got supply one by domestic firms. G or D1 is demand amongst our people for goods and services. So under free trade, the amount of imports coming into the country is the difference between C and G. So the shortage of goods and services at price world is met by importing goods and services in. Now look at the benefit. If we go from being a closed economy, the blue, then there's a massive winner. The massive winner is the consumer. They can access more goods and services at a much lower price. And therefore, demand will extend massively. But you would argue it's bad for domestic firms because that lower price will mean that some firms close down and that could be really, really bad for domestic jobs. So what we do is we're not going to ban imports from coming, but we're going to place a tariff on them. And that would raise price from PW all the way to PW plus T. So price world plus tariffs. Right now, look at this then, what this does. By introducing tariffs, we have a huge loser. The consumer will be faced by a much higher price, which means demand would fall. Now, what we can do, we can measure the impact on consumer surplus. Consumer surplus will fall by introducing tariffs by the area PW plus T to B to G all the way to PW. So I'll say that again, PW to PW plus T plus B plus G. So that is the area which measures the impact negatively on consumers. Higher prices, therefore there's a much lower um, consumer surplus been generated. Now domestic firms though will win. They will gain extra producer surplus. That is equal to the area PW, PW plus T, A, C. So the idea is a big slab of that consumer surplus that has been lost has been transformed or transferred, should I say, to domestic businesses. So consumers lose loads. Domestic firms will generate some benefits through extra prices, which means they've got more producer surplus. Now, the government will also win as well. Now, as the price of the world increased to PW plus T, the imports coming into the country will fall to A to B. Well, those are the goods which are now having a tariff placed on them. So the government will generate tariff revenue of A, B, E, F. So the government will gain that slab of consumer surplus. So let me say this again, everyone. The big loser is the consumer. Tariffs will mean when we move away from free trade to tariffs that consumers will lose PW to PW plus T to B to G. Now, not all of that will be lost from the market because a big slab of it will pass to producers. So PW to PW plus T to A to C will be gained by producers. The government will also then gain A, B, E, F in terms of tariff revenue. But look at that, though, from the overall big loss in consumer surplus, we are left with the two triangles, ACE, ACE and BFG. So these are the welfare loss of tariffs. So everyone, the big loser from tariffs is the consumer. The winners are the government and domestic producers, but the consumer will lose more than what businesses and the government will gain. We therefore get an overall loss of economic welfare measured by ACE, BFG. So based on that, everyone, tariffs are terrible. OK, right now, another diagram, subsidies. This just shows the impacts of domestic subsidies given to firms. Now, again, what we've got, we've got supply domestic and we've got demand domestic. So under um, a closed economy with no international trade, the market would be in equilibrium where supply domestic meets demand domestic. Now, when we allow in a um, infinite amount of imports, supply will move outwards to supply world. 
right now look at this now at point x that is where domestic supply would in effect be at the world price now the problem is demand domestic will be all the way at z so x to z will measure the inputs coming into the country in free trade so anything up to X will be supplied by domestic firms. X to Z, the shortfall in supply will, will be met by imports coming in. Now, if we give a big subsidy to domestic firms, then domestic supply will move outwards to supply domestic plus subsidy. This will therefore mean that at the world price, domestic firms will now produce all the way to Y. So at the world price, the number of imports has fallen from X to Z to Y to Z. So X to Y shows the drop in imports when we introduce subsidies to domestic producers. You could argue for consumers, this is a lot more palatable than tariffs because what this does, it means that price levels aren't going to go um, up. But you've got the big impact on government finances of funding all these extra subsidies. Right, what I'd now like to think about then are these questions. So again, hit pause and write down your answer to these questions. I want you to pay, take particular attention to the diagram, the tariff diagram and the subsidy diagram. I will be expecting you to draw these for me in class, so make sure you understand what these diagrams show. Right, when you're happy, please hit play. Just a couple more things that I want to show you. Right, guys, now you've got here then the last couple of things that I want to focus on. The arguments for protectionism and the arguments against protectionism. Now, I'm genuinely focusing on tariffs here. Some of the biggest arguments in favour of protectionism could be this. The infant industry argument allow domestic firms who potentially could be really competitive in the future to grow and flourish. In the absence of foreign competition, once they've grown and become successful, you can remove those protectionist policies. It could be about diversifying the economy. If you rely trade to be based purely on absolute and comparative advantage in many developing economies, that would mean they're stuck with agriculture work. So if you want to develop a manufacturing base, you might need to put protectionism in place to allow those industries room to grow, to help diversify the economy, move it towards a bigger portfolio of output that you're producing. Um, it could just be to raise revenue for the government or tariffs generate tax revenue. That could help improve government finances. It could also be to protect key industries. This could be sunset industries which employ lots of people. It could even just be um, industries of strategic importance to um, think about that self-sufficiency argument. Problems though, you've got retaliation. So other economies might impose similar restrictions on your exports. You've also got the problems of higher import prices, which means that consumers have to pay more. It lowers consumer surplus. Um, higher price in the economy will also you know, mean that people can buy less. That can create job losses um, in other industries. If you're paying more to buy essential food that's now in, well, still important, but you are paying more for it, it reduces your ability to buy, buy other domestic goods and services. Um, you are protecting inefficiency. You're almost um, encouraging inefficiency because you, you're saying to firms we're not very good take these big subsidies or tariff we'll protect you with tariffs to keep you in operation but if that happens then you know you are allowing inefficient firms to carry on you, you may be better to let them go bust and then the resources move towards more efficient industries across your economy and then finally protectionism can keep smaller national firms which can't benefit from the same economies of scale so if your firms can no longer export because of protectionism, then it means they can't expand their market overseas because of retaliation, which means they can't, can't lower the average cost of production. You're also potentially preventing your firms from accessing a global supply chain, which might give them cheaper um, resources to produce within their economy. So, guys, final thing I want you to think about this. Do you believe protectionism is a good thing? Try and identify yes and no, and then have some overall judgment. Give me your final opinion, please. Right, guys, well, that's the end of the video. Make sure you answer this question, though, and I'll leave you there. Thank you very much.